Hello, I'm Ann Del Castillo, Commissioner of the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Industry Forum at the New York International Children's Film Festival. We at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment are proud to be a founding partner of this important event. Our agency is charged with supporting New York City's creative economy, film, television, theater, music, advertising, publishing, digital content, and nightlife. Our Office of Film, Theater, and Broadcasting provides support for on-location filming throughout New York City. NYC Media operates the largest municipal broadcast television and radio network in the country. And our Office of Nightlife works to support a thriving nighttime industry, which has given birth to so many of our most influential cultural movements. Through our programs and initiatives, we support industry and workforce development in order to ensure access and opportunities for a diverse talent pool. Together, these sectors represent over $150 billion in economic output annually and over half a million jobs for New Yorkers. But more than that, they define New York City as a global creative capital. As someone who started at Sesame Street, children's programming is particularly important to me. But also, as an only child of, single, of a single immigrant mother, I experience the power of children's media. My mother likes to joke that Sesame Street, my, my babysitter, but really what was important was that I saw my experience as an urban American of immigrant heritage reflected in programs like Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, and Electric Company. So I thank the New York International Children's Film Festival for their vision and commitment in presenting this forum. And I thank all of you for being here and engaging in these important conversations. So with that, I now turn it over so that you can begin our program. Hey everyone, I'm Maria Cristina Villaseñor. I'm the Programming Director of the New York International Children's Film Festival. And I'm my gifts Programming Assistant, Stephen Custer. We're so happy to welcome you to today's panel, Beyond Binary Storytelling and Kids Media. It's the third of five talks in, New York's in the New York International Children's Film Festival Industry Forum Series toward an inclusive future. Um, as part of our nonprofit mission at NightGIF, we champion intelligent, artful films for young audiences that also offer them an opportunity to reflect on their developing identities. Through film, kids can experience the transformative power of art and storytelling, diverse storytelling, something that should be readily accessible to all. So to ensure this, in February 2020, NIGF expanded our focus beyond merely who is watching these films to who is making them. We invited creatives, industry leaders, and filmmakers to discuss how we could actively and collaboratively create an inclusive media and film culture for kids. And today's conversation, Beyond Binaries, is a key part of this goal. It truly is, and I'm truly fortunate to have Stephen working with me. I want to thank Stephen as well as um, Emerald Wright Holly, who was um, the moderator for our first panel. It's really a collaborative effort here um, to do the kind of programming we do and really mindfully um, curate the kind of conversations, not only for kids and families, but also for you all um, in terms of the um, you know, dialogues that we need to have and that we want to have. So thank you all and welcome. Um, I also want to thank all of those folks that made today's conversation the whole series possible. A special thanks to our founding forum partner, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and also to Unifrance for their support of the full industry series. Um, and thank you to everyone, to our participants um, who are amazing and you're going to see um, very shortly to our moderator and to all of our supporters. Um, and be sure to tune in for the rest of the panels. There are two more that are going to be following these. They're every Thursday and the next one is panel four next Thursday, going global, diverse storytelling in a diasporic world. We also invite you to connect and participate throughout today's conversation and here's how. 
You can drop your thoughts in the chat at any time and additionally use the Q&A section to ask for our panelists some questions. Then I'll be back later in the conversation to field them. We'll also publish a Google Sheet in the chat if you'd like to share contact information, portfolios, and or CVs among the audience today and those of previous panels. We can't wait to see and hear about your work and you. Yeah, the conversations have been great in the chats and um, throughout and we read them all and we are excited for you all to connect. So please do engage. All right, so now it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Madeline Dinono. Madeline is the president and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. And she serves as an executive producer for the Emmy nominated series, Mission Unstoppable and also the film, This Changes Everything. And notably, she is also on our Night Gift jury. Um, we're grateful for all that you do, Madeline, and we're excited to hear uh, your conversation today. So over to you. Thank you. And the Institute is a proud longtime partner of the festival, and we've been thrilled for our participation. So before I begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm currently on the traditional lands of the Chumash people. And although we are meeting today on a virtual platform, we're all connected by the ground beneath our feet, which is historically the home of indigenous peoples. So without further ado, our discussion today will really center around the importance of inclusive programming for queer children and also helping all of our children understand gender and sexuality in age appropriate ways. So uh, I want to welcome our esteemed group of panelists. And I would first like to start off and introduce Lindsay Amer, whose pronouns are they and them. Lindsay is the founder and CEO of Queer Kid Creative, a multimedia production company spreading queer joy throughout the queer focused intersectional all ages media. They write, produce, and co-host Queer Kid Stuff, an original LGBTQ plus educational web series. Also their TED talk on the importance of gender and sexuality education currently has over 2.5 million views. Welcome Lindsay. And next we have Dr. Ernesto Javier Martinez who uses the pronouns he and him. Ernesto is an interdisciplinary literary critic, an award-winning writer, and a professor in the Department of Indigenous, Race, and Ethnic Studies at the University of Oregon. And for his works, including the short film, La Serenata, he has received numerous awards, including the Imogen Award and the HBO Latinx Film Competition Award. Welcome, Ernesto. And last but not least, um, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Noelle Stevenson, whose pronouns are he, she, and they. Noelle is a New York Times bestselling writer, cartoonist, and the showrunner of Netflix, she and The Princess of Power, which Gina actually had the pleasure of doing an episode. Um, we love the show. They are the author of the National Book Award nominated graphic novel, Nimona, and co-creator of the GLAAD award-winning series, Lumberjanes. Welcome, Noelle. Hi, everybody. So we're essentially gonna have two rounds of questions, a big meaty round and probably a quick lightning round. And for this, this first round, we're really gonna think about and talk about crafting an authentic voice with intention, with all of our esteemed panelists has done. So Lindsay, starting with you, um, what inspired you to use your voice to start Queer Kids? Uh, what has the response been? And where are we uh, in terms of educating children about LGBTQ plus um, community? Uh, so can you kick us off? Yeah, for sure. Um, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, lots of big questions. I'll do my very best to keep it short. Um, in terms of inspiration, I mean, I really make the work that I wish that I had when I was a kid. I grew up in a liberal space with a lot of privilege, but I still had a really, really hard time understanding my queerness and my transness and my non-binary identity and really didn't start coming out until I was in college. And then I came out as non-binary when I was like 25. So it's been, a long journey for me and it still is a long journey for me. And I think a really big part of that is because I 
these identities weren't reflected to me when I was a very young person. And I had to kind of search for them on my own without much of a map um, to speak of. So I really found, you know, when I was kind of coming up and figuring out who I was as a person, but also as a creative, that I wanted to marry these two passions that I had for queerness and understanding gender and, and these kinds of ideas around my identity and uh, storytelling for children, which I fell in love with in undergrad. Um, and I found when I kind of tried to put those two things together, it just really didn't exist. So I started kind of trying to do that on my own. And that's sort of how Queer Kids Stuff was born because, um, you know, I, I put it up on YouTube as kind of this shoestring budget little project that I really just kind of wanted to put out into the world as a passion project and it just kind of blew up. Um, and I, it was not something I was totally ready for, but it's been a really cool and wild ride. Um, and you know, I, it, I've dedicated my career to, to doing queer and trans representation and education for young children and families. Um, and it's been cool to watch kind of the series. Um, we did four seasons and over 50 episodes proper um, of the web series. It's turned into a live performance series that I've taken to schools and libraries all over the country. Um, I actually just spoke at a Zoom room of 200 high schoolers this morning. Um, and I do a lot of professional development work as part of it as well. And I'm also just kind of a creative. And uh, yeah, it's just spawned all of this stuff. So that's been really cool. Um, in terms of the response, it's been really polarizing from the get-go. Um, I, When I started doing this work in undergrad, I directed a play called The Transition of Dutable Kenyo by Gabriel Jason Dean. And it was for elementary schoolers and one of the characters is a young boy who likes to wear dresses and we tried to tour it to schools in the outside of Chicago where I was studying and it got canceled at one of the schools and this was you know when I was in my early 20s just starting out doing this work and uh, that was really tough <laughs> and was really kind of like a highlights reel of all of the responses that I would get um, kind of moving forward in my career and you know I think that there's a huge amount of support from the LGBTQ plus community. Um, all of my kind of audience that are progressive families and educators and also, you know, queer folks themselves are just incredibly passionate about this. I, you know, I got my stats for the YouTube channel last month and, you know, I don't upload actively anymore, but uh, we still have 24,000 views this past month. So it, it really is like a huge passion for it. And then, you know, where we're at, it's it's moving, but it's moving very slowly. Um, and, uh, you know, speaking from just an American perspective, it's, it's tough and it really depends on where you are. And I think that that really has to do with the fact that there's nothing really, especially in preschool, um, in mainstream spaces. And that's something that I think really has to change. And I think it has to change because it's urgent right now with anti-trans legislation that's really sweeping America um, and how you know that's impacting the day-to-day -day lives of trans kids now today. <laughs> and every no that I get and every no that any queer creator gets is actively violent against those kids who are feeling that legislation right now. So that's the urgency. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully that was a nice run, quick rundown of all those questions. But I'm not done with you yet. Um, just a follow up. So as you have been traveling, you know, around the country, um, what kind of questions do you get from parents? And I, and I know you said there's progressive, you know, parents. So, um, uh, what kind of tools are they asking you for in order for them to have these conversations, you know, with their children? Yeah, everyone's asking for media. Everyone is asking for books. Everyone is asking for television shows. Everyone is asking for stories and asking for characters. That is what in every parent, queer parent Facebook group that I'm in, everyone is constantly asking for those stories and those characters. And I can maybe list like a handful, um, including she -Ra, which is great. Um, but it's, there's just such a lack. And like, you know, there's education out there and you know, there's, there's stuff happening in those spaces, but what parents really want is stories. And I think that that, you know, gets overlooked a lot. Well, uh, building on that in terms of storytelling, uh, Ernest, Ernesto, I'm gonna turn to you. Um, can you talk about um, how your work kind of operates at the intersection of culture and queer 
visibility and acceptance, um, especially as it relates to Latinx representation. Um, and um, also I wanna talk about your award-winning uh, short film, uh, La Serenata. Yeah, thank you. I'm so excited to be here on the panel with you all. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, you know, in terms of under, in terms of my motivation for beginning to develop my voice in speaking to children and youth, um, uh, the motivation both came from a, an organizing capacity. Um, uh, the my, I've been organizing with queer Latinx academics, artists, and activists for an enormous amount of time, and I've been rubbing elbows with folks for quite a bit of time. And we began to understand that one of our passions was to connect with youth. We also realized that as queer adults, um, we had a lot of things to process as queer adults in relationship to our own youth and to our own past. And so um, I, I, I guess I begin by talking about this motivation because I think on the one hand, we can tell a story about underrepresentation and the impact of underrepresentation on young people. Um, and we can also then also, I think it's just important to plant ahead of time, the idea that when queer adults communicate with queer children, it's a profoundly radical act. Um, it's a radical act because we have often been kept away from young people, right? We've been seen as threats to young people. And um, also because the, the, the desire to speak to young people actually presents an opportunity for us to really take stock of where we're at. <laughs> what are we delivering to youth? And so um, I share that only because um, I'm actually relatively new compared to these folks here. I started writing for queer youth um, in 2018 when I published um, When We Love Someone, We Sing to Them, Cuando Amamos Cantamos, a bilingual queer uh, Latinx children's book about a boy who loves a boy um, and about a family who decides, to, a father who decides to teach him about the Mexican tradition of serenading people that you love. Um, and um, that uh, uh, then motivated me to collaborate. And oh, and the this is one of the illustrations in the book. It was illustrated and mentored by Maya Cristina Gonzalez, who is, you know, she's a lot of things, uh, an illustrator, a children's book author, but she's also, um, a, she's a healer at her deepest. <laughs> and um, so that motivated me to then collaborate with Adelina Anthony, a, a Chicana lesbian director in LA, an actor, who um, we collaborated on the film version, uh, which is a little bit more complex storytelling for a, a, an older um, family audience um, uh, with a similar kind of thematic. Mm, so I raised, I raised this issue of, um, I said something about underrepresentation, right? So just to put things out there, um, Latinx people are about 18% of the US population, but only 5% of children's books uh, have Latinx representation. And we have, um, you know, more books were published about animals and inanimate objects than Latinx, African American, Asian American, Native American people combined. Um, so we know the representation is low, but we also know through research that uh, the impact of not being represented is severe. And um, uh, in ethnic studies, we talk a lot about spirit murder. So um, we talk about spirit murder to highlight the ways in which societies at various levels often not in cahoots, but at various levels, <laughs> um, uh, destroy our ability to think of ourselves as positive. And we will survive, right? So we will, well, uh, some of us will survive. Um, and we will do all kinds of coping mechanisms to survive on a spectrum of like harmful things we might do to ourselves to, to, to um, other uh, more uh, healthier community oriented things. And so I, I mentioned the spirit murder in relationship to underrepresentation, to say that yes, we are uh, queer people of color are affected by lack of representation, but it also affects majoritarian groups as well, right? So the the, the point of 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 seeking more representation is not just for minority groups, but in fact, um, to help um, help majority majority groups understand that their vision of the world is quite limited. Um, when they keep on getting fed certain narratives. Um, yeah. I have a follow-up for you. So <laughs> um, uh, can you talk about the impact that your children's book has had? Um, and similar to what I was asking Lindsay, um, 
Have parents written to you? Have, or is it in libraries? Have schools tried to incorporate it? Like what's, what's been the, the trajectory um, since the book came out? Oh, thank you for that. Yes, so um, the American Library Association gave us a really good shout out, uh, put us on the rainbow list at the beginning, which has meant that it's been incorporated all over in, in all kinds of libraries. Most recently, um, we were added to about 200 libraries in uh, Washington State and, uh, and schools and the school system in five states have um, have um, uh, committed to kind of engaging with it. Um, I would say, uh, and I've been contacted by, yes, beautiful. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the, the song is about a boy who eventually sings to another boy. And this, uh, this, this uh, visual is the moment where the, the protagonist is trying to feel, is trying to understand what it feels like to love because his father has been teaching him about how important it is to love. And we decided to do a non-narrative, just visual moment to kind of capture or to tune kids to the moment that somehow, sometimes you have to be intuitively aware of your body, what your body is telling you, yeah? And so I think maybe, so yes, we've been getting some support from institutions and parents, but also some of the, we were very purposeful about what we included in the children's book around healing and, and transformation. And, um, and one of the examples, for example, is that we represent a moment where a father pauses when the little boy asks for a song for a boy who loves a boy. Um, but the pause is just meant for the parents to kind of intuit. It's not meant to reharm kids, to have kids question <laughs> whether their parents love them, but to also just signal, right, that we know that parents, even queer parents, <laughs> right, when, when they, you have queer kids, you are positioned, you know so much about the world, right, and so you're positioned to pause, take stock, and think, okay, how are we going to do this, you know? And so have you translated it into audio where there's actually, you know, a song that can be sung? Um, yeah. Have you done that yet? Or? <laughs> no, no, yet yeah, thank you for that question. So when we made the the, the children's book and, and morphed it into a short film, which is currently available on HBO Max, if people want to see it, um, it's called The Serenade, La Serenata. Um, the boy sings a song and we created an original song um, by Grammy nominated artist Hector Perez. And it's available, um, it's called Garden of Butterflies, Jardín de Mariposas. I might add it to the, to the chat. Um, you. you can get it on Spotify. It's the first ranchero bolero um, um, uh, to describe love between two, uh, a boy for a boy. And so, so it's in Spanish. Um, so yeah, so we have that song. We have that song, the lyrics copied in the children's book also, and then the, the song is available. Excellent. Yeah, so let's uh, make sure um, Stephen can put something in the, uh, in the chat there. So um, building along storytelling. Um, and uh, so Noel, <clears throat> we've had the pleasure of knowing you. Um, you graced us at Gina's Film Festival, the Bentonville Film Festival. So it's so wonderful. And you put her in one, put her in your show, which she loved. So she loved the purple of it. Um, so you established your voice, you know, very early on, but you know, through through animation and classic um, genre storytelling. And can you talk about what it was like for you to use your voice uh, to include, you know, diverse you know, representation and a really progressive, you know, world worldview. So I'd love for you to just talk philosophically because you've been doing this a really long time. Yeah, I guess I have. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, I started um, writing stories, uh, especially for uh, with queer representation and for queer kids um, before I myself was actually out. And so it was, it was interesting. It was an interesting, um, I, it, you know, that representation was intended to reach out to queer kids and, and people who loved them. Um, but it also ended up reaching out to me before I was quite ready to engage with those things within myself. Um, and I just felt this hunger for stories that, um, that included plot lines and characters and just something different than what I was getting at that time. And so it was something that I, I think at the time I wasn't even 
totally sure what what was driving me. Although in the years since then, I, it's become quite apparent. Um, I was just trying to tell stories that felt true to me and that would reflect the everyone else that out there in the world who needed that. And so, and it was very important to me. I remember with Lumberjanes, um, it was sort of, we always intended it to be a, a queer comic series. Um, but early on, it was already, there was, you know, there wasn't really much out there in the YA or all ages comic sphere at that time. And so early on, we had to, there were moments where things were changed at the last minute or they were edited out. And it was just, it was something that I just never realized how hard it would hit to have to compromise or to have to see things sort of pushed to the background. And um, that hasn't really gone away. I think that's happened in every single project that I've done in some way or another. And sometimes I feel that the best skill that I've developed, which is, I, I mean, I hope that it's a skill that that we won't always have to have, but it's the skill of um, knowing how to like sort of hold things with an open palm and, and never stop pushing, but also understand that there is so much fear, even from people who genuinely want the best, they genuinely want to do the right thing. It, there's still just like a, a, a fear around how much is too much, how, mu how soon is too soon. Um, and truly, I just, you know, when you get a no, I find a hundred more ways to, to try and get a yes. And so that is just something that, you know, I, I have um, had to learn the hard way in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, but I hope that the more panels like this we have, the more creators on this panel like this that we have out there, getting work published, getting work onto screens and into kids' hands, that that struggle becomes a little less difficult, that it becomes something that, you know, you you hold that door even when, you know, I think the, the next generation, sometimes I feel like the next generation is separated from us by only a few years. That's just how I think that things are are moving along right now because of how quickly technology is changing and the world is changing. Um, but being able to hold open that door and then in turn holding it open again, those are the things that will let these uh, works continue to exist, continue to move a little bit farther ahead and to understand that it's like sometimes you're there to be a shoulder for someone else to stand on. Um, and I hope that, you know, I can always be that. So I, uh, um... I want to lead into another question. Um, actually, it's multi-impact. Is you know you're in the big leagues. Um, uh, you're in commercial. You know, very commercial. Everybody wants a pitch. Everyone wants to sell. Everyone. You know, you're in that lane. And so, from a consumer standpoint, um, what has been the feedback that you've received? Because obviously, parents and consumers can message you or message the show on social media, and then B, can you give some context to, because for we, we have creators in the audience, um, is there more receptivity? Is it one and done? Well, we have a she -Ra. We don't need another show like that. Or are you getting approached um, in the more commercial world to say, hey, you know, can you do a show with us or we need more content uh, shows like this? So are you seeing progress in terms of the receptivity from the business side to say, yes, you know, there is a, a demand. So I know big giant two-part question, um, but yeah, I'd love for you to enlighten us. Um, what I've seen is that there is a huge demand for queer stories. Um, I don't have the exact stats in front of me, but a, mu a significant portion of youth today identify as being somewhere in the LGBT uh, on the on the spectrum in some way, and that is something that is I, that is a lot of who I'm hearing from is a lot of these young people who are starting to come up and are using their platform to have their voices be heard, and the families of kids who are maybe too young to be using social media, but the way that you know families can sit down and watch these shows and these movies or read these books with their kids. And that is something that it gives families um, dialogue and a vocabulary to talk about them together. Um, so I do think that it's a that it's a huge um, consumer base uh, that is asking for more, 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 more. And that's why I think you know, Shira, um, a lot of 
one, not only did she sort of built, build on the foundation that shows like Steven Universe set up for us, uh, it's something that I'm seeing also, it's like, especially those younger audiences are being like, they're consuming it and then they're being like, well, we still want more. I also want representation of all of these different experiences and stories that aren't featured in the queer media that we already have. It's only a drop in the bucket. Um, and so that's something that I think that in, in answer to the second part of your question, that absolutely we've only begun here. We've only just started. And again, like it, it's something that I, I hope to see the media both that I'm a part of and also that I have the privilege of consuming to just keep being able to move in leaps and bounds past what we've already done. I think that those those stories, even once, you know, like there was a time when, let's say the kid, or the, not the kiss, um, sadly, uh, <laughs> the romantic moment at the end of Korra was truly groundbreaking. And it was something that had never been seen before in children's media. And unfortunately they were pulled back, they were censored because it was just, you know, uh, the executives were not ready for that yet. And that's something that wasn't that long ago. Um, and then Steven Universe was able to, you know, move ahead in, in these incredibly important ways. And then because of all of the ways that they pushed the boundaries, we were able to ask for similar things by being like, look, Steven Universe did it. It worked out really well for them. It was really successful. Can we do this? And so that's something that it's just, I, I think that it is all just about continuing to try and set up future projects for success as much as you can. Um, and from what I've seen in the industry, there's a huge appetite for it right now. But I also think that it's something that for us as queer creators, we have to continue sort of challenging our own imaginations because we grew up in the same world as everyone else. We grew up with certain ideas of what the limits of our fiction are. And we have to unlearn those things. We have to keep moving forward and uh, and trying to imagine bigger and bigger things. Because again, like our, our imaginations are limited in some ways. Um, and it's just something that I am so inspired by everyone else on this panel and everyone who has uh, created queer media because it helps it helps broaden my sphere as much as as much as everyone else's is as well and so that's something that it's like we are very much a community we are very much working together on this in some ways and so that's something that I feel very privileged to be able to be a part of and so you know we were talking about consumers consumerism so of course you know as a storyteller uh, it's one thing to have a show but you know, you're developing IP. So have there been opportunities to consumerize uh, with merchandise and extensions, um, you know, of, of She-Ra? I mean, is that, is that currently happening? Is that something that now you're thinking about as you're writing your next story? You know, what's the franchise? What's the package? Um, are there opportunities for that? I think um, She-Ra definitely has more merchandise than anything I've ever worked on before. It definitely is not a given in animation. Um, I, I don't think that I'm particularly motivated by that though. I, I want for everyone to be able to have, you know, uh, merchandise of a property that they love. But I, I, I would not say that that is my primary eye towards the stories that I create. I think that I'm more focused on making sure that the stories themselves strike a chord and ring true. And if people, you know, want to buy plush or t-shirts or pins or anything like that, then that's just something extra. I, I see a lot of times, and this is true for a lot of media, is just that like sometimes what sells in a very literal sense is, is what decides what gets greenlit and what isn't. And so it's like, well, we know that X product will sell because we've sold a billion of them already. And so therefore we can't make this project because it just won't sell enough merchandise. And so that is something that it's just, I think that really can hurt creators um, just based on what's getting bought. And it is just something that it's like, again, it's cool if it happens. I do want everybody to be able to have cool stuff. I have my own cool stuff on display behind me, but um, it's not my primary focus. And I, I would prefer to see a media landscape that is not so affected by the merchandise side of it, because that can also affect the content of what we're consuming in a, a way that maybe does not 
help the content itself. It doesn't necessarily move that narrative forward. Um, so yeah, I guess my my feelings on that are are a little complicated. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely makes sense. So um, so we're going to go into kind of a a, a lightning round, and then we'll uh, jump into Q and A. So please make sure you're putting your questions um, in the chat. Uh, Lindsay, I'm going to go back to you. So this is the um, shameless promotion part of the show. <laughs> what is happening? What's next for you uh, in terms of you know queer kids uh, taking over the world? Um, and also, um, I would like to hear from each of you if there are creators out there. Um, you know, are there tropes and stereotypes that you would like to annihilate uh, and never see ever in any kind of children's media? I'd also like um, to get your unique perspectives on that as well. Yeah, um, just like quick what I'm doing, I'm doing a lot. <laughs> um, Queer Kid stuff has just continued to grow as an organization, um, we're launching a membership in June during Pride. So that's like a pretty exciting thing. We're working on growing our community and really directly reaching families and educators and parents and kids through digital space. So that's something that's kind of in-house in a, hopefully a more autonomous way for the way that we function as a business. So that's exciting um, on that front. Um, I have a big project that I'm writing right now that I can announce, which is like the worst thing that I, I hate saying, um, but it, it, I hopefully will be able to announce that next week and it'll hit shelves in 2022 if that's a good enough hint. Um, I am also writing for a new preschool show that's coming out of Canada. Also can't say what that is, but that's going to be really cool. It's very similar to what I do with queer kids stuff. So using a lot of skill sets that I already have. Um, uh, what else? Um, I do a ton of consulting and professional development. Again, just was talking to a high school this morning, um, doing tons of pride um, performances and professional development, but also just like family stuff. Um, there, I'm actively pitching television shows right now, live action um, and animation with um, trans and non-binary protagonists and queer centric worlds, which is really exciting, getting a lot of no's, <laughs> but still pushing. Um, and I have a feature link screenplay that is that has a Jewish trans uh, coming of age story that's like very Disney Renaissance film. Um, so trying to get that in different places as well. And I think <laughs> that's it of the many myriad projects I'm doing. Um, and then stereotypes that I want to get rid of. Um, uh, <laughs> just like the invisibility of trans masculine people in media generally. Uh, I don't know if that's like a stereotype or like a lack of a stereotype, <laughs> but that's something I would love to um, fill space on. Thank you. Ernesto, over to you. What's next? Is there something we can look forward to uh, that you want to promote? And again, for you also, are there tropes, stereotypes, storylines that you would just like to annihilate um, from kids' content. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so um, in terms of what I'm working on, I, I'm freelance for um, Sesame Street and um, Silvergate Media and uh, Nine Story Media Group in Canada. And so I also have a project of film that I can't talk about in detail, but it's an animated film that I'm co-writing. They just finished co-writing, really excited about that. Um, and, um, and we're writing the feature length version of La Serenata. Um, so that my co-director and I have partnered up and we've been having this beautiful experience expanding the world from the short film to the feature. Um, and then we're having a great time with that. Um, let's see. Um, I, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I would just say uh, in terms of stereotypes, I think I'll just say one thing that um, in our film, the La Serenata, we have a father that's a gardener. And um, at the New York Latino Film Festival, an actor said, why did you do that? Why did you like, we're, we're done with this. And I said, um, I told him, you know, I think what you're trying to say perhaps is that you're done with having gardeners not have interiority. <laughs> what you're done with, right? So I think this question of stereotypes, yes, we get saturated by artifice and vacuousness and filler, um, but I think we can return to stereotypes and rescue 
folks and really the state, you know, it's not the rescue the stereotype, it's rescue the people who are being beat down by these stereotypes. Um, so we developed a father who, you know, didn't kick the ass of his child when he, um, when he came out. And so there you go. There's, there, that's the gardener we want to see in the world. Excellent. That's a great point. Thank you so much. So Noel, over to you. Shameless promotion. What's happening? What's coming out next? Um, and of course, for you uh, being the fabulous creator you are, if there's any uh, trope stereotypes, storylines that you want to see permanently eradicated from the universe. Um, yeah, so I'm working on a ton of stuff, like a ton of stuff right now, um, maybe uh, too much, <laughs> um, but it's all in early stages. A lot of it has not been announced yet. Um, one thing that has been announced is uh, the animated show of Lumberjanes, which is in development, still early stages, but, you know, hoping to be able to share more about that soon. Um, I am contributing to a bunch of different projects. I am pitching my own show and movie, uh, working on something really cool with my wife that uh, we're hoping to write and direct together, which will be awesome. Um, and then I'm also working on more in the book space that also hasn't been announced, but hopefully soon. Um, and there will just be more, hopefully, hopefully very soon, there will be more to announce and more announcements coming out. Um, so I, I can be a little bit more specific about what I'm doing. Um, in terms of your question, I actually think Ernesto had a great uh, take on that, which is like the stereotypes exist because these, these, um, these characters are already underrepresented. And so the tropes that arise are ways of dehumanizing those characters and making them not have that interiority or that depth. And so that's why, that's when those characters start to like, those tropes become negative stereotypes that can really hurt. Um, but at the same time, like I, I think especially with queer media in especially queer characters in children's media, the the trends that are arising are because there are so few of them in media and so there are only a very few um characters that are try that are you know, shouldering that weight of of representing a pretty broad group of people so there are shortcomings and there are flaws in those trends um but at the same time, so like for a while, I remember there was one year where lesbian characters were killed off in mass across tons of different shows. It was this trend that was not intentional. It was not coordinated. And yet it was a year of just like gay characters dying one after the other. And it was incredibly hard. And the message that that sends is that there's no future for you. There is no happy ending. There's no, we can't imagine you getting what you want and, and being happy. And so for a while, I think I still sort of, um, hold true to this myself, but like maybe just for a little while, queer characters have to be immortal. But that's like, I don't know if that should be true forever. I still want the gay Titanic one day, a tragic love story that doesn't, like I, I still want people to be on the edge of their seat, not knowing if their favorite character is gonna survive or not. I don't think that these things, I don't know that I would want them eradicated from the earth forever, you know, just right now, that's not what we need. And so I think that that is true about so many things, especially when it comes to non-binary and trans characters, which again, we have so relatively few amount of them that when trends do arise, like it can also feel like the characters do not have as much depth or as much interiority as they could have, but also that just like, it's not the range that we need. We don't have the diversity of these characters that we need. Um, so I'm also gonna agree with Lens, which is just like, you know, I want to see more trans masculine characters. I wanna see more butch characters. I just like, you know, I, I'm, uh, there are certain trends that we maybe like, are locked into by what people are asking for or paying attention to. But I don't think that that, you know, I think that we need to continue expanding our own imaginations, pushing others to expand their imaginations and trying to keep this world ever expanding and ever encompassing of a larger and more diverse group of people. Thank you. And just to give everybody at home uh, some data to back it up, you know, in our studies of advertising TV film, with an eye on kids content, we have found, <clears throat> although the baseline for population for the LGBTQ plus community in the United States is about 4.5%, uh, 
when it comes to this type of popular programming, uh, these characters, that community is like under 1%. I mean, it, 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 and it's just not growing, you know, fast, fast enough. So, um, and the thing is, you're, you're talking about fiction. So who cares what the baseline is for the US population? I mean, it's a very low bar um, to hit. So get working, everybody. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna bring uh, Stephen uh, Custer back for Q&A. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, for this amazing conversation so far. Um, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, it's blowing up, so I'm just gonna try to pick out a couple. Um, and for the first one, I'm gonna try to lump in um, several of them um, about different scale and registers of projects. So um, do you all feel that it is important um, that in order to make change that your projects slash films have to have extremely large audiences or your projects always successful, no matter how big or small the audience Along with that, how do you balance the desire to create content that can reach more people and audiences, but also potentially that um, criticism of selling out? Um, and when do you know when to compromise and when do you um, end in a bigger space or when do you know to really push an idea forward? Um, so, yeah. I would say that we need both niche and also mainstream representation. Both are important. I think that when it comes to major corporations and uh, movies and TV shows and projects from huge studios, representation is really important in those. It does reach a really broad group of people, but I don't think that that should be our main focus. I think that our time is better spent focusing on some of the smaller projects that are being authored by queer people, about you know personal stories and that's like by supporting those projects that puts pressure on those bigger studios to have to like evolve in order to keep up so i think both are important but i i absolutely don't believe that the worth of a project is defined by how broad the audience is yeah i also think that like small projects can grow <laughs> i think that you know what i've done is testament to that fact and just like persevering through the smallness of it but also like the, how big of an impact even a small thing can have. You know, if you reach one queer kid, you're reaching one queer kid, that's huge. Um, and you're changing a life that is enormous. So it's, you know, it's like the, there's no small actors thing, there's no small project. Um, and then I do think that the one caveat here is that kids media and children's media is specifically a little bit different because I do think that pop culture really matters to kids. I think that like pop culture reaches young children in a different way because like a kid can't really go on the internet and just like find my stuff willy nilly. They need to kind of be pointed to it. So that's up to gatekeepers and parents. So people, kids who are finding my stuff are already in a space where usually that's gonna be okay. And they're gonna be in a space where like they don't necessarily need it as much as a kid who's going to be gatekept from it. So that is like the one caveat there that I think that they are equally important, yes, but there is a specificness to kids where pop culture is very important. I would just add that in my, um, I was a recent 2020 fellow, writing fellow at Sesame Workshop and um, uh, in the six week uh, boot camp, basically, where you're every every week you're writing and every week you have executives come in and talk about your work. I was getting my ass handed to me, basically. <laughs> um, one person said, like, um, I don't ever I, I, I can't imagine anybody buying this. And so but OK, so there I was. <laughs> and um, I ended up continuing develop, to develop this. And it became my writing sample. And it's the reason why I've been hired um, you know, at, at three different um, production uh, studios. Uh, I will say it hasn't been produced. And yet it, it was me practicing my voice in a very, I feel, in a very authentic way, in a way that was trying to heal myself and connect with my community. I feel like in some version, I want to see that made. And so I, I use it only as an example, not to say, yeah, take that. It's simply to say, sometimes um, you can create, you, you have to listen, you have to listen to people, right? <laughs> but you also have to start to cultivate your voice. You can't continue to just be the mirror of like, what do you want? I'll write it for you. 
um, right? Uh, there's something missing there if that's the only motivation. Um, and so I, I found a route, a small project, niche, 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 people saying, I, I don't see this being made. And then it becomes my writing sample that people enjoyed enough to hire me. Yeah, I think what you all touched on there was really important of just, I think sometimes of what you, Lindsay, said of that a small project can be a, become a big, big project. And with kids media, of um, there's a lot of barriers to access and it's not necessarily like the independent scene that adult media is or anything like that. So sometimes you just have to go out there, you gotta do it, and then hopefully someone will find it and another person will find it. And then just multitudes of that we can have within this media space is just um, really important. Um, so next um, question is, what's the relationship between art and activism in your work? How does your approach to activism and um, inform your art? And what's the responsibility of art vis-a-vis -vis activism? If anybody would like to start. Yeah, I, I mean, my art is my activism. It's it, it's inextric they're inextricably intertwined. <laughs> um, there's no separating one from the other. I am both, um, and everything I do is always both, no matter what it is. Just because of who I am and my marginalized identities, I honestly like can't escape activism. I became an activist by accident. I didn't necessarily go into this to become an activist. It kind of happened to me. Um, and that's kind of like a hard part about this, <laughs> of kind of being forced into that role. Um, not that I don't love it. I, I, I do have come to enjoy that part, but it is, they are so intertwined, so intertwined. Um, I'll just jump in. I'm, I, I came into it as an activist. I came into it with the social issues being forefront, the community being on my mind. And then we found a medium through which we could figure out how to process our own histories and now tell new stories for, for uh, Latinx families that centered queer youth. And I think um, the, you know, I think we, we need to think about what we mean by activism. Sometimes we have such a high bar of what activism looks like, or also it's a stereotype of what activism looks like. And I think um, this is where I, I remind like friends and family and students um, to think about when, when I ask someone what your politics are, I'm not asking whether you're Republican or Democrat. I think of politics as people who say, like, what is your understanding of oppression and what are you doing to change it? That's what I mean when I ask you, what are your politics, right? And I think and in that sense, then I think we can think about our art as a, addressing what, what problems do we see in society and what are we doing to address it, right? I think activism also implies a little collectivity too. So, right, so I think artists sometimes can say, I think, and have said for centuries, like, I, I just do the work, people can do what they need to do with it, right? And there's, but that's not the only vision of an artist, right? There are artists who are writers, <laughs> painters, who are also then actively working with others to, to transform society. Yeah, and I, um, I agree with both my fellow panelists. And then also I just, you know, wanted to add that um, all art is political, even if it is trying to market itself as not being political, that's political. And so everything we make, that message matters and that message has an impact on the world and that's both our privilege and also our responsibility. Um, and, I, and I think that it goes a step farther because there is more responsibility behind the scenes as well. There is a duty that you have to perform for the people that share that industry with you or for the people who should be more represented in those industries. And so both of those are other ways of engaging with activism, even though that might not be the most forward facing thing. Um, that is something that is still, you know, uh, Hollywood is having, having a reckoning about that right now. And it's something that it's like, we cannot take the pressure off. We cannot decelerate. We have to keep going. This has, these conversations have to be had and those things, are inextricable from what we do as creators. Can I just add one more thing? I think that I, I, was, I was at a pitch meeting and the person who I was pitching to interrupted me and said, don't, um, don't ever say social justice, like just get that out of your language and just tell us the story. And um, as, as, an, as an affront, uh, as, as, as impacted as I was by that, I also want to just say that some like, 
in when you're in when you're engaging with an industry you have to understand what that industry is <laughs> and you have to uh this is not about picking and choosing your battles it's understanding that you have opportunities and windows and um and sometimes the opportunity to do good work might not look like you're being accepted in your full self and I, actually that's my biggest take home about the industry like i don't always feel my full whole self and granted, I think I don't always have to feel my full whole self in engaging for business. I do want more and more spaces where I can carve out an ability to include more people with me. And right, but I think um, I think that's interesting in terms of how one approaches the industry with ideas. Um, I've, I've 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 been told a few times what I need to be doing. Um, I don't agree, but I, I I'm, I'm I'm hearing what they're saying, and I'm thinking, okay. I don't have to be my full self right now. You might not be the person that I want this project with, um, right? So we're learning. We're learning what what people are are saying. Perfect. Um, and then um, just a final wrap up, um, and hopefully ending on um, a hopeful note of this combined question of what energizes you or gives you hope, and then along with that, what are your favorite queer shows, books, movies, comics, um, besides your own that potentially inspire you, um, that help you move forward, um, anything like that. Boy, it's a bad question. <laughs> I mean, I think I get hope every day. I get hope from panels like this. I get hope from, you know, other queer creators. Um, I, I, I get hope in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think that it's something that's like, even, even when it feels like that hope is slipping, it's something that it's just, it's never, it's knowing that there are other people out there fighting, um, that gives me hope. Um, yeah, and, and every time I see um, queer media that is championed by, you know, a queer creator, a marginalized creator, that is something that is, uh, it just, it is so huge and it's so inspiring. And um, yeah, I'm also, you know, inspired by my wife uh, and, uh, you know, that's one queer creator I'm especially inspired by. So <laughs> hope that fits the question. <laughs> Yeah, um, I desperately miss live performances and being in front of parents and kids and families and in schools um, and in libraries and in spaces where I can be in front of young people. <laughs> um, I desperately miss that. Um, I mean, I, again, I keep referencing the high school that I talked to this morning, like that just gave me like so much steam for today and getting through just like the daily frustration that is a lot of this work. Um, so yeah, so the young people that I'm like doing direct action with, and also when I'm, you know, talking to adults and grownups who are actively engaged in this work and like really want to be a part of it and want to help and want to like exponentially spread this message. Um, that's what really gives me hope. And then, and my peers, um, like the two of you and, and other people really trying to push forward and, you know, the people who are rising up with, uh, <laughs> with me and, and with us and, and trying to get these stories told, um, people who have the shared passion for it. I can feel it when I talk to other people about it. Um, so yeah, that's really inspiring. Um, and then uh, work that inspires me. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I can point to any one thing, <laughs> um, but uh, I just really love queer art. <laughs> I just love it. Um, and I think that's, you know, every time I see myself reflected, I mean, I loved the Oprah Elliott Page interview. Like that gave me like so much joy, things like that. Um, not even just kids media, but yeah, things where I can see like a little spark of the world changing. Um, that's what inspires me. Yeah, and um, I think something that Noel said um, about we, we were discussing what it means to kind of like get to a certain place, but also leave the door open for other people. And I've heard from African American mentors a different metaphor about send the elevator down back down. And um, I, as I've been sitting with those metaphors, leaving the door open and 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 sending the elevator back down, I've realized that 
for me, what energizes me is that I've realized that it's, it's actually not leaving the door open or sending the elevator back down, but realizing that you're, 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 you're asking for community. I need community in order for, for me to even inhabit this new place that I haven't been at before. And so in a way it's like, um, it looks like I'm helping others or it might look like that, but really it's like this need to be in community um, and to not be alone. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you're learning something and then you try to teach it to someone because you, it's like the way that you're learning it. Like you, you, need, you need to be in conversation with somebody else in order for you to get it, right? And I think um, Noel's statement has helped me uh, remind myself that this is about, you know, we're moving, you know, as we move forward and we're making opportunities available to others, it also feeds us. And it's also not just a kind of hierarchical thing always. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, having grown up on a lot of the traditional legacy kind of superhero shows, um, you know, it was inspiring for me to see the reinterpretation, you know, of Batwoman um, that's out there right now. And, you know, a lot of the excuses that you'll hear in the industry is, well, that's legacy. You know, we can't mess with that character. And um, I love that we're seeing more and more in the superhero universe that we are able to pioneer. We are able to reinvent, you know, these characters that can go back to, you know, the 1920. So that's, um, been inspiring to me personally. Wonderful. Um, well, looking at the time, unfortunately, um, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to this conversation. Thank you for everybody to the, um, the attendance, um, being so active and lively in the chat. Thank you for creating this little virtual community for this past hour. Thank you to our, our absolutely wonderful, fantastic panelists. Thank you to Madeline for helping moderate this conversation. Thank you to Gina, the Gina Davis Institute for all of your support. Um, next week, we'll continue the series on May 20th at a different time for at 2 p.m. Eastern and at 11 a.m. Pacific time, where we'll have our fourth panel, Going Global, Diverse Storytelling in a Diasporic World, um, which will uh, discuss diverse decolonial media in an international space. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Um, and have a good evening or afternoon or wherever you are in the world. Bye. Bye.